West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy with Chef Justice Putnam. Netrootsradio.com where the government says regulators have approved the Oxford AstraZeneca coronavirus vaccine. It becomes the second vaccine authorised for use here in the UK. The British Prime Minister is celebrating the approval with this tweet. It is truly fantastic news and a triumph for British science that the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine has been approved for use. We will now move to vaccinate as many people as quickly as possible. As possible. CNN's Phil Black joins me from here in London with the latest. Uh, uh, Phil, finally a dose of, of good news. Talk to us about the advantage of this vaccine and crucially when they expect it to be rolled out. So very quickly they plan to roll it out. Deliveries in the next day or two with vaccination starting as early as next week. And what's, I guess, so exciting about this vaccine is that it is logistically convenient. It doesn't need to be kept at deep, store, deep cold storage temperatures uh, as the Pfizer vaccine does, uh, for example. It can effectively be kept in a fridge, which means that it can be moved around and stored relatively easily, rolled out more widely. So you start to get it to more people, and that happens at a much faster rate that has been possible up until now. Trying to maximise that potential, the government has also announced a shift in tactics. Instead of trying to get two doses of vaccines to people as quickly as possible, the plan now is to delay the second dose uh, of the vaccine, but to prioritise rolling out that first dose to as many people as possible as uh, the vaccine stock becomes available. And the logic there is that although you are not giving the maximum possible immunity to specific people as quickly as possible, you are broadly, more broadly, building up a level uh, of uh, protection and immunity across the population. And so therefore that will hopefully allow uh, that level of immunity to, to start to get ahead of the level of transmissions. And that can all happen uh, a little faster than would otherwise be the case. And Phil, there have been questions uh, for some time uh, uh, about the efficacy and whether it can be effective against this new strain that we've been seeing here in the UK. What are you hearing about this? So the, uh, the end results, so the initial uh, phase three trial results from Oxford University and AstraZeneca were a little more complicated than people expected. But there's, I think, the key efficacy figure uh, that is relevant to the UK because it matches the dosing regimen that is going to be applied here. And that is two full doses uh, of this particular vaccine results in an effectiveness of 62%. That is, 62% of, of trial participants who received that dosage did not uh, develop symptomatic COVID-19 sim uh, infection uh, 14 days uh, or later after receiving their second dose. And crucially, no one received, uh, no one suffered a severe infection that required hospital treatment. So that's the key figure. There is some confusion because over the course of the trial, 
there was a mistake, which meant that a small number of the trial participants received an initial dose that was weaker than planned. But then when they got to the end and had their second dose, that, that particular subset of the, of the trial group was found to be the better protected with an efficacy of 90%. Now, because of that, uh, Oxford University and AstraZeneca believe they have stumbled upon a potential sweet spot for dosage. But what they now need to do is prove those results more broadly because we're only talking about something over 2,000 people. They need to prove with further study and trials that yes, that half dose initially somehow results in even greater protection because at the moment, they don't know why that would be the case. So the UK has adopted, using the bulk of the data that uh, AstraZeneca and Oxford University have compiled, to go with two full doses. And, and they believe that that will make a really significant difference uh, in terms of slowing the transmission of the disease over time. Please. Phil Black there for us in London. Thanks very much, Phil. I want to bring in our uh, Lawrence Young, he's a virologist and professor of molecular oncology at the University of Warwick. Professor, thank you very much for joining us. Let's start with the breaking news out of the UK. How much is this vaccine a game changer? Well, it really is. And it's a, it's, a, it's a ray of hope during a very, very difficult time for us in the United Kingdom. And the benefit of this vaccine, of course, is twofold. One is that the UK government have ordered 100 million doses. And the second is the logistics. It's much easier to roll out because it doesn't require uh, ultra cold temperatures for storage. So it's, it's, a, it's a good news day, really, given everything else that we're going through at the moment. Do we know, Professor, whether it's effective against this new strain, given the number of cases we have seen the two days in a row of record cases out of the UK and how much that new strain is behind that increase, that surge in the numbers? How effective is it against this new strain? Well, it's, it's likely that the surge in cases we're seeing is because this new, more transmissible strain is replacing all other varieties and variants of the virus. We know from looking at the changes in that in that virus and where the mutations have occurred that it's extremely likely that the vaccines that are all being developed at the moment, including the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine that's already being rolled out in the UK, and this Pfizer and the and the new AstraZeneca Oxford vaccine, will be effective because the body's immune system mounts a very profound and broad response to the virus. And these small changes will not affect that immune response. Right, but having what you've just said to me, if we take, if governments take a long time, let's say, to actually vaccinate the population, is there a change? Is there a, a fear within the scientific community here, Professor, that perhaps the mutations will keep occurring and that will make it harder for vaccines to actually try to be effective? Is there a fear of that? Yes, there is. And it's a, that's a very good point for two reasons. One is we've really got to get on and vaccinate as soon as possible to try and stamp out the virus. But we also know the virus is changing and we also know that the virus will continue to change and will change in response to vaccination. So whilst this vaccine program is so important, what we've got to do immediately is continue with these harsh restrictions because whatever happens with the virus in terms of it changing, it will still transmit in the same way and therefore the restrictions that prevent transmission, that is wearing face masks, being very careful about hand and face hygiene, social distancing, being careful in crowded spaces and the need for ventilation inside, all of those things will prevent transmission of any variant so what's really important, and we're going to hear more about this, I know, today in terms of further restrictions in the UK, is that people yeah. take notice of this, realize that even with these variants, we can stop transmission. Uh, and Professor, we heard, uh, I don't know if you heard our correspondent Phil Black uh, at the top of the show in the last few minutes saying that potentially the vaccination plan is to try and vaccinate at least the first round as many people as possible, then build and then vaccinate much later the second round. What is the thinking behind that? Is still is that to break? Is that to build a, a strong immune system? W what can you tell us? Well, we know that all vaccines work best if you give two doses. There's a priming dose that alerts the body's immune system, and then there's the boosting dose. And the time between those two doses is very, very variable. What we know from the data coming out of 
most of the vaccines being developed, but particularly the the, uh, the AstraZeneca uh, vaccine, is that the first dose does give you quite a proportion of protection, right. so that you get an, an, an immediate protection. And given the need to roll this out to as many people as possible, it makes sense in the first round to get as many people vaccinated with the prime vaccine. And then up to 12 weeks later, you've got a margin of about three months before you need to give the second dose. So I think this is a, a very sensible approach to ensuring we get as many of the vulnerable folk in our population, our healthcare workers vaccinated as soon as possible. So, and it does make, it does make immunological sense as well. Right. Very briefly, a Professor, I'm hearing from the Health Secretary, Matt Hancock, who has said in the last few minutes that the UK will be out of this by the spring. How realistic is this, you think? I think that's really optimistic. I mean, the, the issue here is one of, of, of logistics, um, yeah. getting this vaccine rolled out to the entire population and certainly the most vulnerable is going to take time. And I'd love to think we could do this this side of the uh, of the spring I, I anticipate it being a little a bit later but we've just got to get on with it we've got to get all the organizational logistical uh, bits and pieces in place whilst we know our national health service is under so much pressure it is wednesday the 30th of december of 2020 and you are in west coast cookbook of speakeasy I am your chef de cuisine, Justice Putnam. Gunner the English Bulldog is our snoozing sous chef. And our daily special is Smothered Benedict Wednesdays. Oh, a velvety hollandaise sauce over a lovely egg dish. Oh, my gosh. Hey, um, it's the 30th of December. I have to confess, it is now an ominous date in, the, in our family. Uh, this is the day two years ago where my 41-year-old son passed away of an undisclosed heart condition only undisclosed to his mother and I. Uh, he, actually, he did disclose it ever so obliquely, and uh, none of us were aware of how severe it was. He kept that close to the vest, so to speak. Uh, the grandkid, his kids, my grandkids knew, of course, and um, uh, the last year he uh, spent a lot of quality time with them and took them everywhere and set them on a proper, proper path. And for that, we are forever grateful. So uh, the remembrance of my son, I'm trying not to mourn, I'm trying to celebrate. But it's still hard. Two years. Uh, last year was really rough. One of the roughest periods of time I've ever experienced in my life. Uh, you think you you can prepare yourself in, you know, in any hypothetical scenario. That's what I try to do. I will admit I didn't put myself in the scenario of losing a child. Not. You know, when he was younger, yeah, you know, we worried about crib death. And then when he started to drive, we worried about car wrecks. And then when he was old enough to drink, we we're worried about car wrecks while drinking and, you know, all this stuff. But, you know, we set him on a proper path. And unfortunately, uh, his heart was uh, made a little bit differently. Big guy, too. Um, taught boxing and other other forms of self-defense. And a great rapper and had some really good musical chops. You know, we did give him some music lessons when he was younger and they came to fruition. So um trying to celebrate, but it's still hard because of the loss. He's not here anymore. I, I can't just DM him. I can't just pick up the phone. I can't just hear the phone ring and know it's him. None of that happens anymore. So, uh, the passing of Letlow at 41 certainly resonated. And you know what's weird how the human mind works? How it attaches meaning to all sorts of random events? It seemed like the number 41 kept popping up on me everywhere. But I know how, you know, we attach meaning to things. But it was still, I don't know, odd <laughs> to see myself going through that behavior. And knowing what it is. So, you know, you can assign bumps and uh, little noises in the middle of the night to something that you want to be. 
but it may not necessarily be. So back to Letlow. I find no glee in his death. Oh, Glenn Greenwald was out there this morning, you know, dragging Molly Zhang fast of all people. All she said is that he died at age 41. She didn't say anything. And he accused her of smugly spiking the football on this guy's death. She did not. She's a year younger than the guy. He had no pre-existing conditions, neither does she. It just seemed scary. And I don't blame her. Oh, but Glenn, Gr- Glenn, Glenn Greenwald, and I asked a question. Have you ever seen anywhere, has he tweeted anywhere, has he made a public proclamation anywhere, like on Fox, dragging the right wing or a repug for smugly spiking the ball on a tragedy befalling a dem? Have you ever seen that? But he's right there, accusing Democrat Democrats or liberals uh, or anti, anti-Trump of spiking a football on a tragedy, and I'm trying to find it. Oh, bringing up that he was maskless at his victory party? Bringing up that the economy was much more important than the safety of his constituents, and that's what he ran on? Well, safety of who he thought would not be safe. You know, there was this meme put out that it only affected black and brown people mostly, you know, those people. So we don't need to do anything about that. In fact, that's good. It's like terraforming. Other people call it genocide, but, you know, why split hairs? No one is spiking the football on this guy's death. If anything, he was a foot soldier used as fodder in this weird war, and I don't know why they even have this war, except it's a war against representative democracy. And apparently Letlow is one of their foot soldiers they're just willing to throw into the, into the breach and become cannon fodder. How dare they? How dare they? We're going to have 400,000 dead by the inauguration. 400,000 dead. And then you have, in my old neighborhood, the Fairfax. You had 50-some-odd maggots storming the Erewhon uh, grocery store there. Maskless, saying it's their freedom. All they want to do is shop. Well, get out of the store. We're closing the doors on you mofos. Don't shop here. We don't want you. Had to call the cops. During a pandemic. This is a hideous disease that causes hideous deaths, and it is hideous and repulsive that it has been so summarily dismissed. Why? Because it might impact the economy. Damn right it impacted the economy. How about a little bit of foresight? How about a little bit of planning ahead of time like we had in place that was dismantled? All departments of the government have been hollowed out. To be filled with what? Russian nesting dolls sent by Vlad. Sounds like that to me. But I'm trying not to get into the conspiracy parts. Just look at the facts. So much news. We could talk about the uh, the bomber. Oh, yeah. How about his girlfriend calling up the cops? And the FBI looked into it. Said he was building a bomb. But they found out he wasn't Antifa, so they went away. That's how it works. They said, the cop said, he, well, he wasn't on our radar. Well, how about looking at some police reports? Stop looking at the radar. How about looking at the actual written reports? That's what your job's supposed to be, wasn't on our radar. Yeah, it was below your radar because it was in the inbox, in a police report inbox. Come on. You look at the uh, success rate on, on uh, murder convictions. Murder investigations, then getting a conviction on these murder convic- uh, murder investigations, and you find out the cops are bad and old, just about 180. I don't know if that's good enough to be in the big leagues unless you're really good in the field. Enough of these sports metaphors. As I intimated <laughs> so long ago, there is a lot of news in the world, but we have curated a show for you today. I like to choose stories that might 
fly a little bit under the radar, so to speak. <laughs> you know, the obvious ones, you, they're obvious. Go ahead, and you can't avoid them. But I'm trying to find things that might be, uh, well, uh, pass by because everything scrolls by so fast these days. What's on the curated part of the show here in the B- Bistro Cafe part of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy? Well, at the top, that was, yeah, I think that was uh, CNN Europe <laughs> breaking down the UK approved Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine. That is a ray of hope. And it uh, looks like we were getting a slew of vaccines. Let's just hope they're all tested properly. And uh, I'm in the I'm in the demographic where I'm supposed to be getting a shot. But uh, now it's up to the states. <laughs> yeah. Remember when Trump said, oh, well, you know, it's up to the states to get the PPE and the uh, ventilators distributed. What's their problem? Get moving. And then as soon as the states started doing that, and they made these contracts to get things delivered. Trump sent his federal goons to hijack the trucks, confiscate the materiel, and then that materiel ended up in Russia. And I'm not kidding. So that's what's happening. They talk about the Russian vaccine being used right now, and I think they're going to have a backup of some Pfizer vaccine that we got from Germany. Because I think Russia and Germany are mad at each other right now over in the Volney. I think. On the rest of the menu... A federal judge stopped Georgia officials from blocking 4,000 people from voting. And when they say Georgia officials, what they mean is true the vote, true the vote people from Texas coming into Georgia to muck things up. But, you know, they're on a team. It's like a traveling team. The railroad industry has installed an automatic braking system on nearly 58,000 miles of track. Ahead of a year-end deadline, just in time. Tomorrow is the end of the year! And the Federal Aviation Agency will allow small drones to fly over people and at night. Like, nothing's going to happen with that. After the break, we move to the chef's table, where Singapore arrested one of their citizens who spied for China in the United States. And this is after he served his term in a prison in the United States. Well, they got to check it out. I wouldn't blame them. And Spanish police found a warehouse full of Nazi memorabilia as they arrested three leaders of an international arms ring. I wonder what they were going to do with those arms. All that and more. On West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon Appetit. Page at netrootsradio.com. To the rightish of the page is the chat room link. The chat room is monitored by Kelly Lincoln, and thank you, Kelly, for doing so and for doing so much more. If you would then take a gander to the leftish of the page, near the bottom of our homepage at netrootsradio.com, there is a link to our Patreon page. We have that there because though the uh, bulk of how we uh, how we run this operation, this powerhouse of resistance, comes out of our own wallets. We are unable to do it without you. And there have been a few of you who upped your recurring contributions to us uh, during the holidays, and thank you so much. Uh, Flash is stopping here in December, and and, and uh, we have to replace the old Windows 7 Dell uh well, yeah, it's a Dell machine, Insp- Inspiron, Inspiron, I won't call it an Inspiron. And it's had its four plus year run in this almost 10 year uh, tenure of resistance radio here at Netroots Radio. And if you would like to uh, contribute after the holidays and are able to in these times of turmoil, 
How it usually happens is that people send us the equivalent of what they would spend on an espresso type coffee drink once a month, and then we stretch those dollars and we pay our bills and we fly under the radar because <laughs> there's no written report up on us. Even if, even if they uh, did decide that we're flying under the radar, but because we fly under the radar by paying our bills, we are somehow able to continue resisting as the founders originally intended. Oh, so many years ago. All kidding aside, thank you for your generosity. And uh, we do take our civic duty quite seriously, indeed. If you would like to follow uh, Netroots Radio on Twitter, Tom takes care of that. Thank you, Tom. Find uh, Netroots Radio on Twitter at Netroots Radio. <laughs> it is so simple. Now you can find me at Justice Putnam, N before the M, man spelled backwards now. And uh, I post the show notes and links diary on Daily Coast about 10 minutes before showtime. And uh, I get that linked up on Twitter and other social media platforms, as one does. Follow the show on Twitter at Cookbook West, and please pick up podcasts by way of Spreaker, Stitcher, TuneIn, iHeart, YouTube, iTunes, and wherever podcasts can be found. Okay. I got Gunner the English sous chef just right underfoot right now, but... But he wants to be close. Our other dog, well, my mom's little dog. It's a, uh, it's a little uh, Yorkshire poodle mix, Yorkie poo. I think is what they're called. I don't know. I'd call him a poo poo poodle shire, poodshire, poodshire. Well, it's a Yorkie poo. But uh, a neighbor dog. No, this is what's weird about a pandemic. You got to be careful, even when people are socially distancing. What about your animals? Uh huh. Hopefully, there's no uh, uh, bug jumping, <laughs> you know, from the microscopic level from the dogs. We got the visible bugs taken care of. Okay, we mitigated that before they happened. But uh, Ginger, the little Yorkie poo, uh, apparently might have some sort of canine flu that it got from the neighbor dog. Now, my big gunner, the English bulldog, our snoozing sous chef. He had been having a bit of a little runny nose, but he is so uh, stoic, <laughs> if a dog can be stoic. And you never know how much he's hurt. Or if he is, you know, he just, I don't know, he hides it. He guts it out for some reason. But uh, uh, the little Yorkie Poo has been a little bit ill. And uh, we think it may, no, it hasn't been officially diagnosed. We'll find out tomorrow uh, after the show. And uh, what's going on? But uh, she hasn't been feeling too well, and I'm getting a little worried about her. She's not a young, she's not a young gal anymore. Mom's had her since she was a pup, but mom's had her for you know quite a while now. But uh, I'm a little worried about that. So hopefully she'll be fine, and uh, maybe we'll do a show on Friday. I'm not quite sure. Maybe I should take a day off, but I don't know. I don't know. The show must go on. I have it in my blood, okay? <laughs> Nothing's going to stop this. Do you know that, uh, uh, I, well, I wasn't doing a daily show, or was I at the time? I might have been uh, some sort of after type thing that we were doing a while ago. And when I went into ICU, I was able to pull, still pump out some shows. So, well, at least the station never stops it for those reasons. We keep it going. Anyway, let's uh, dive into this first offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. It's out of the American Independent, but they picked it up from the Associated Press. And when they do that, it's because the APs put out, you know, one of their anonymous worker bees for the holidays uh, put this together. So here we go. A federal judge ordered local election officials in Georgia to allow voting by more than 4,000 people whose eligibility was being challenged ahead of... Next week's runoff elections for the U.S. Senate. Now, of course, they are voting early right now, but you know what they mean. The actual cutoff day. U.S. District Judge Leslie Abrams Gardner. Oh, did you know that she's related to Stacey Abrams? Well, you know, that's what you get. Wait until Merrick Garland gets some uh, court cases again. Uh huh. He's right there. Well, uh, she blocked election boards in Ben Hill County and Muskogee County, which includes Columbus, 
from forcing large numbers of voters to prove their residency before casting ballots in the runoffs. The judge ruled that denying so many voters access to the ballot so close to an election would likely violate the National Voter Registration Act. So I guess the Supreme Court has to get rid of that now, too, don't they? Republican Senators David Perdue and Kelly Loeffler both face runoff elections next Tuesday. If both lose to Democratic challengers Ossoff and Warnock, Democrats will take control of the Senate, as if you haven't heard already. Challenges against roughly 4,000 voters in Muskogee County and more than 150 voters in Ben Hill were part of an effort by the Texas-based conservative group True the Vote. You mean like throw out the votes. To coordinate challenges statewide under a Georgia law that allows any registered voter to challenge the eligibility of any voter within the same county. So they had to find some repugs out there, registered, of course, to challenge another person on the other side, which happens to be the Democratic challengers and voters. The group said on December 18th that it was bringing challenges in each of Georgia's 159 counties against more than 364,000 voters whose residency was being questioned based on change of address data obtained from the U.S. Postal Service. Another DeJoy operation. It's up to local election boards to determine whether the challenges have merit. Several, including in Fulton and Cobb counties in Metro Atlanta, have rejected them because election officials in Muskogee and Ben Hill counties had determined the challenges had probable cause. Anyone on the challenge list attempting to vote would have been required to prove their eligibility, as would anyone challenged who mailed an absentee ballot. The judge's order blocks the counties from impeding voting by anyone who was challenged, saying federal law prohibits systemic removal of voters from the rolls within 90 days before an election. 90, not 19, 9 zero, three months. Attorneys for the county election boards had asked Gardner to recuse herself in the case. The judge is the sister of Stacey Abrams, Georgia's Democratic nominee for governor in 2018 and founder of the voting rights group Fair Fight. Well, she's just following federal law. Josh Funk of the Associated Press brings us this next offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Smothered Benedict Wednesdays. The railroad industry has installed an automatic braking system on nearly 58,000 miles of track where it is required ahead of a year-end deadline, federal regulators said yesterday, Tuesday. Federal Railroad Administration Chief Ronald Batori said railroads worked together over the past 12 years to develop and install the long-awaited technology known as Positive Train Control, or PTC. The roughly $15 billion braking system is aimed at reducing human error by automatically stopping trains in certain situations, such as when they're in danger of colliding. Well, that's a good idea. Derailing because of excessive speed. That's even more important. Entering track under maintenance. Well, you don't want that. And traveling in the wrong direction because of switching mistakes. Well, you want that even more so, don't you? PTC is a risk reduction system that will make a safe industry even safer and provide a solid foundation upon which additional safety improvements will be realized, Batori said. The National Transportation Safety Board had said that more than 150 train crashes since 1969 
could have been prevented by positive train control, which was required in 2008 after a commuter train collided head-on with a freight train near Los Angeles, killing 25 and injuring more than 100. Did you know, and I'm sure a lot of people aren't aware, that Amtrak shares the same railroad lines as all the freight trains, and the freight trains get uh, priority. So uh, just remember that and uh, plan accordingly. I kind of liked it. One time we were pulled off on a sidetrack while five hours of freight cars went by. Five hours. It was very slow. We were up in the Cascades, but still, it was pretty The braking system uses GPS, wireless radio, and computers to monitor train position and speed, and it can give engineers commands. The NTSB said the system could have prevented the December 2017 derailment of an Amtrak passenger train in Washington State that killed three passengers and injured 57 people. Ian Jeffrey, CEO of the Association of American Railroads Trade Group, said completing the positive train control systems is an important milestone for the industry that will enhance safety and springboard innovation long into the future. Offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy is out of Reuters by David Shepherdson. Small drones will be allowed to fly over people and at night in the United States, the Federal Aviation Administration said. A significant step toward their use for widespread commercial use. The FAA said its long-awaited rules for the drones, also known as unmanned aerial vehicles, will address security concerns by requiring remote identification technology in most cases to enable their identification from the ground. Previously, small drone operations over people were limited to operations over people who were directly participating in the operation, located under a covered structure or inside a stationary vehicle, unless operators had obtained a waiver from the FAA. The rule will take effect 60 days after publication in the Federal Registry in January. Drone manufacturers will have 18 months to begin producing drones with remote ID, and operators will have an additional year to provide remote ID. There are other more complicated rules that allow for operations at night and over people for larger drones in some cases. The new rules make way for the further integration of drones into our airspace by addressing safety and security concerns, FAA Administrator Steve Dixon said. They get us closer to the day when we will more routinely see drone operations such as the delivery of packages. Companies have been racing to create drone fleets to speed deliveries. The U.S. has over 1.7 million drone registrations and 203,000 FAA-certificated remote pilots. For at-night operations, the FAA said drones must be equipped with anti-collision lights. The final rules allow operations over moving vehicles in some cases. Well... That's a lot to keep track of, but I guess they're going to have to get the technology to keep track of it. We'll see how this ferrets out. But on the other hand, maybe drone delivery is the way to go in the days of the pandemic. All right, let's get to our break. And when we get back from that break, we will go through weather from around the world 
and we will finish up with the stories that we have curated for you today. You are listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, and we will be right back. You are listening to NetworksRadio.com. Please hang up and try again. From a point at sea to the circles of your mind, a new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new earth. This is Take Two Movie Review. I'm Clinton Johnston. This week, refueling. There are a lot of nits you can pick in Wonder Woman 1984. The mascara doesn't really fit in the story, but they take us there anyway. The conceptual link that anchors the movie's theme to Diana's spiritual core isn't really a thing. And exactly which Amazon thought that golden suit would work as armor? Was it the one who fled the island and later took a job designing new wave ensembles in Milan? And also, Diana and Steve fly across the world and back. When and how did they refuel that plane? You could go to town. But unless you're a sick person who gets off on feeling superior at someone or something else's expense, why would you? You'd just be missing all the great things that Wonder Woman 1984 has to offer. And there are many. Do we need their mascara? No. But be honest, we want to go back there. And anyway, the whole segment rocks. Here's Steve Trevor, even though the character died 70 years prior. But again, they make him work. And yeah, the golden armor. But it's also kind of fabulous. Look, sequels are hard. And there were a lot of hopes and expectations riding on this one. And under that pressure, Patty Jenkins hooks up the fuel lines and delivers us a colorful and fun fable that pulls us so much into the struggles of the characters that when the fights finally come, we say, oh yeah, there's supposed to be action scenes here. Plus, Chris Pine, Kristen Wiig, Pedro Pascal, and of course the returning Gal Gadot all deliver some really warm and fun moments. And I like this whole thing of Wonder Woman movies being about lessons that Diana has to learn to make her more mature and wiser. In a world of mostly unquestioned privilege, look, just remember what I've told you. Not even a melodrama, Wonder Woman 1984, is closer to a fable where it's more important to confront what's inside of you than defeat what's coming at you. And it's also welcome proof that the first film wasn't a fluke, that Wonder Woman movies are ten times better than any other flick that DC puts out. Except for Aquaman, they're only two or three times better than Aquaman. This has been Take Two Movie Review. I'm Clinton Johnston. Catch up with us at TakeTwoMovieReview.com and feed us back on our channel on YouTube. This is Scientific American's 60 Second Science. I'm Jason Goldman. We literally get down on our hands and knees and start slowly sifting through the leaf litter looking for bits of hair or a little chunk of bone. Tom Gable is tracking a predator. In fact, he's tracking a whole pack of them. Oh, it's very much like a crime scene investigation. Since 2015, the University of Minnesota conservation biologist has used GPS collars to track 30 wolves inside Voyager's National Park. Those collars led Gable and his team to kill sites. And there, amid the leaf litter, were bloodied bits of fur and bone, clues about how wolves alter the ecosystems they live and hunt and kill in. The long-term study is, in a way, a quest to broaden a science story that goes back 25 years. For wildlife ecologists, the story of the reintroduction of wolves to the greater Yellowstone ecosystem on January 12, 1995, has become canonical. The story goes something like this. As the elk grew to fear the wolves, they changed where and how they foraged. That gave willows, cottonwoods, and aspens a better chance to grow near streams. It also meant more riverside berries for foraging grizzly bears. And it led to alterations in the flow of those streams, sending water in new directions. Wolves outcompete coyotes for access to prey, so coyote populations plummeted, which led to a rise in fox, rabbit, and ground-nesting bird numbers, and so on. Ecologists call this row of biological dominoes a trophic cascade. Regardless of your inclination, I think it's hard not to be like, wow, this is amazing, right? If that is true, that's really incredible. New findings cast some doubt on the idea that wolves primarily regulate the greater Yellowstone ecosystem through fear and intimidation. And regardless of the situation there, very little research has been conducted on this question in ecosystems that don't resemble the mountains and grasslands of Yellowstone. Which brings us back to the boreal forests of northern Minnesota, 
and the ground that Tom Gable and his team have been crawling over the last few years. During the winter, wolves work together to kill large prey like deer. But Gable found that in warmer, ice-free months, wolves focus on smaller prey, like newborn deer fawns, and especially beavers. And that's where things get really interesting for the ecosystem. Wolves, by preying on dispersing beavers, alter where wetlands are created. If a young beaver gets killed after leaving home, it will never have a chance to build a new dam. Even if it had started construction before becoming a wolf's lunch, the dam will remain unfinished and fall into disrepair. Beavers are ecosystem engineers, so when a wolf kills one, it can have a big impact. Because they prevent beavers from converting a forest into a wetland. And in that regard, wolves are then connected to all of the ecological processes that are associated with wetlands and beaver ponds. Ecologists have long assumed that predators can influence their ecosystems in two main ways. One is through fear and intimidation, like in the Yellowstone story. The second is through direct killing. The Voyager's wolves offer up a third possibility. The park and the forests surrounding it have more than 7,000 beaver ponds. Gable estimates that wolves have a direct impact each year on around 88 of them. That's a mere one and a quarter percent affected. So it's hard to argue that wolves are responsible for reshaping the ecosystem in the broadest sense. But it's equally hard to deny that they help to maintain a diversity of habitats across the landscape. But I don't really think that estimate is... um a key finding, so to speak, because I think the real goal or the real point of our paper was simply to, to flesh out that this mechanism um, of how wolves do this. The study was published in the November 13 issue of the journal Science Advances. You know, this is something worth studying, um, and this is likely happening in a variety of ecosystems. Thanks for listening. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Jason Goldman. This is an important message from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. When it snows this winter, make sure you clear more than your driveway. Before you hit the road and before you get in the driver's seat, check to be sure that your vehicle's tailpipe is clear of snow. If the tailpipe is blocked, carbon monoxide, an odorless, colorless, and deadly gas produced by your engine, can build up quickly inside your vehicle poisoning anyone inside. To learn more, call 1-800-CDC-INFO. That's 1-800-232-4636. In 2012 in the United States, about 317,000 motor vehicle crashes involved a large truck. 26,000 truck drivers and their passengers were injured in these crashes, and about 700 died. Trucker safety requires an alert, buckled-up, experienced driver with a reliable vehicle and a strong employer safety program. Seatbelts are the most effective way to prevent an injury or death in a motor vehicle crash, but in 2013, one in six drivers of large trucks didn't use their seatbelts. Employers can help truck drivers stay safe by committing to driver safety programs at the highest level of leadership, establishing and enforcing driver safety policies, including requiring everyone in the truck to buckle up and addressing factors that contribute to crashes, such as drowsy and distracted driving. To learn more, visit cdc.gov slash vital signs. Hi, I'm Tom Harbin, and since you're listening to netrootsradio.com, show your progressive side and go to the Donate button on the bottom of the homepage. It's progressives like you who power Netroots Radio and keep the progressive message beaming everywhere 24 hours a day. Just go to our Donate button at the bottom of netrootsradio.com. Thank you for keeping Progressive Radio at full power. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. 
On this day in labor history, the year was 1969. That was the day President Richard Nixon signed the Federal Coal Mine Health and Safety Act into law. At least three key events served as the impetus for the legislation. Beginning in the mid-1960s, miners began staging numerous health and safety walkouts across the Appalachian coal fields. Their working conditions were despicable. Then, in November 1968, 78 miners were killed in a methane and coal dust explosion at console mine number nine in Farmington, West Virginia. Miners were outraged when United Mine Workers leader Tony Boyle provided cover for the company's murderous negligence. Then, in January, thousands of miners rallied in West Virginia's state capital along with the Black Lung Association and the disabled miners and widows. They demanded legislation controlling coal dust and compensating black lung victims. When the hearings dragged on, 30,000 miners walked out in a wildcat strike the next month in what is referred to as the 1969 Black Lung Strike. By March, the number would increase to 40,000. The state law passed on March 12th. Fears of a nationwide health and safety wildcat strike prompted Congress to craft and pass the federal legislation. According to historian Paul Nyden, the West Virginia Black Lung Strike was the longest political strike in modern U.S. labor history. The act created the Mine Safety and Health Administration. It mandated annual inspections and increased federal powers of enforcement. The Coal Act also required monetary penalties for all violations and established criminal penalties for knowing and willful violations. The act developed improved mandatory health and safety standards and provided compensation for minors disabled by black lung disease. Minors continue to fight for better conditions, enforcement, and compensation to this day. Like what you hear? Check out more at laborhistoryin2.com. Thank you for accompanying us here to the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Smothered Benedict Wednesdays. We always begin weather from around the world along the banks of the Rogue River in the Rogue River Valley of Southern Oregon on the west coast of the continental United States of America, where it is currently 34 degrees Fahrenheit, expecting to be a tad warmer today than yesterday, only a couple of degrees warmer at 46 And it could be a bit cooler than that anyway. Though we do have copious amounts of rain that may hold in the heat because of the massive cloud cover. Which will be cloudy with rain developing this afternoon. Winds light and variable and we're expecting more than a quarter inch of rain, almost a third. Tonight, uh, looks like we're going to get more than a tenth of an inch of rain. And it will be light rain early, then remaining cloudy with showers overnight. Overnight lows in the mid to upper 30s, winds light and variable. Considerable cloudiness tomorrow with highs in the mid 40s. And then uh, not so much drying out, but uh, we won't have copious amounts of rain. Though on Friday, we're expecting about three quarters of an inch dropping. And then rain for, well, maybe a week every day. We'll see how that develops. Confirmed coronavirus cases in Jackson County in the southern part of Oregon now has risen to 5,721. We're going to be hitting 6,000 really not very long from now, unfortunately, because now we get to see the Christmas parties as they come in. Confirmed deceased has risen by 1 to 69. Pollen right outside the window here in the mothership and Rogue River proper is rated at none. The air quality index for the region is good at 28 parts per million and the daytime UV index is low at 1. Barometric pressure is falling at 30.23 inches. Visibility is down to half a mile, one half of a mile, and relative humidity is at 88%. Weather from around the world is brought to you by people's personal weather stations that they purchased. These people planted these purchased personal weather stations somewhere on their property. And these people positively live around the world. London is 40 degrees and partly cloudy. 
Paris is 43 and cloudy. Rome is 52 and mostly cloudy. Kiev is 44 with fog. Kabul is 30 degrees with smoke. Hong Kong is 47 and clear. Tokyo is 38 and partly cloudy. Sydney, Australia is 68 and mostly cloudy. San Francisco, California is 44 degrees and mostly cloudy with a heavy fog advisory. And New York, New York is a brisk 35 degrees Fahrenheit and sunny. And that is weather from around the world, brought to you by people's personal weather stations that they purchased. These people planted these purchased personal weather stations somewhere on their property, and these people positively live around the world. Worker bees at Reuters bring us this first amuse bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Singapore authorities arrested a man on his return to the city state after he was jailed for spying for China in the United States, saying they would investigate whether he posed a security risk. Dixon Yao. A Singapore citizen returned to Singapore after serving prison time in the United States for acting as an illegal agent of Chinese intelligence. The Internal Security Department, known there as ISD, will interview Yao to establish if he had engaged in activities prejudicial to Singapore's security. Singapore will not allow our nationals to be subverted or used by any foreign actors for activities prejudicial to our security and national interests, the ISD said. The government takes a very serious view of any Singaporean who enters into a clandestine relationship with a foreign government and engages in espionage or subversive activities at the behest of a foreign power, it said, adding such individuals will be dealt in accordance with local laws. Je te donne mon amour pour la vie entière La promesse de me trouver à tes genoux Aussitôt que tu m'appelles, restez toujours fidèle, c'est tout, c'est tout. Je te donne tous mes printemps, mes étés de mer, mes automnes quand les feuilles tombent partout. Si ce n'est pas une bonne affaire, je te donne. Even more anonymous holiday staff at Reuters bring us this final amuse bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Spanish police found a warehouse full of Nazi memorabilia as they arrested three suspected leaders of an international arms ring that sold guns to drug traffickers along the Costa del Sol, the Civil Guard Force said. Following a, following a year-long investigation into a wave of gun crimes in the region, police raided three locations, recovering 160 firearms, nearly 10,000 bullets, and over two tons of explosives. The warehouse where the weapons were found was stuffed with Nazi artifacts, including portraits of Adolf Hitler, German military uniforms and medals displayed as if in a museum. Officers arrested two German men, one of whom had links to far-right groups and a British man. They have been charged with arms trafficking, drug trafficking, and falsifying official documents. According to police, the gang acquired weapons from Eastern Europe before modifying them in a workshop in Malaga and selling them on to drug runners. Well, well, well. That brings us to the end of our broadcast period for the day. But you do know Netroots Radio will broadcast on. And we're going to meet up tomorrow. That's right. 
New Year's Eve day for Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays. So do stay tuned to Netroots Radio all day and all night for all the breaking news as it breaks. And we'll meet up here tomorrow, right here, in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon appétit. Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des théâtres, des photos de bord de mer, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais du frais d'Aster Revoir un latte coël Je voudrais toujours te plaire Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je veux déjeuner par terre Comme au long de golfe clair T'embrasser les yeux ouverts Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver